So the book of Daniel begins and, and is involved in Babylon. Babylon, the first great world empire. It's the empire that took over the Assyrians, the Syrians, the Egyptians, the Jews. It's the empire of Nebuchadnezzar. He, he actually, for, for the first time, I think, in history of, of that time and that age, was ruling the known world. And it's kind of like that old saying, he, he, he had a lion by the tail and he can't hold on to it, but at the same time, he can't let it go. And he's in this position of being a world ruler, and God begins to reach out to him. There in chapter 2, verse 1, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. It says there in verse 1 of chapter 2, in, in the second year. And, and when you read that, if, if you've been paying close attention to the details of the time of Daniel's life in Babylon, you, you know Daniel, Daniel's been there for three years training. To be one of those of a team of soothsayers and astrologers and sorcerers and magicians with Nebuchadnezzar. But this starts off by saying in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, and we know that he's been training there for three years, Daniel has, under Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, in, in chapter 1, we, we saw in verse 5 that it says, and the king appointed for them daily provisions for the king's delicacies and the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. And then in verse 20, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. So, been there three years, but yet it starts off saying, in the second year. Now, a lot of people would say, see, I told you, the Bible has all kinds of contradictions. Can't trust it. Full of mistakes. But in the Babylonian kingdom, in their hierarchy, so to speak, the first year of rule was a year of ascension. And they didn't count it as a year of ruling. True leadership began in the second year. So it says here in verse 1, now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, now he's fully reigning, he had dreams. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. So the king can't sleep. He, he's at the top of the world. He's, he's the world leader. And it says he had dreams. Plural. Many scholars interpret that as the same dream over and over and over again. And he can't sleep. See, it doesn't matter how powerful you are, how rich you are. Even though he's defeated the known world, Jerusalem, the Syrians, the Egyptians, he has money, he has servants, he has gold, he has silver, he has a harem. But you can't buy sleep. And he's anxious. He's disturbed. And here's the deal. The one true God of Israel, the one true God of, of, of the world, of, of all creation, is reaching out to a powerful Gentile unbeliever. He's sleepless. And, and he's paranoid. And, and God's getting his attention and I would just add this, and please listen, please tune in. God knows how to get your attention. He, he knows how to, 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 to speak to you, even if you don't know it through lack of sleep or financial crisis or, or a medical situation or your marriage or your kids. Here God's going to use a dream to show the king of Babylon who the one true God of all creation is. 
and he can't sleep. And so Nebuchadnezzar gave the command in verse 2 to call all the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. So King Nebuchadnezzar calls together the original minds. At this point, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not a part of this. They're, they're just kind of junior soothsayers. So he calls his magicians, his astrologers, his sorcerers, his Chaldeans. And I would submit to you, this is the original dream team that he's called together. <laughs> magicians were, were those who used potions and incantations. Sorcerers, the word pharmakia for us today, they, they use drugs and mind-altering kind of chemicals to, to discover and s step outside of their uh, world. The astrologers communicated with the dead, with spirits and voices. The, the Chaldean was, was a kind of a priestly group that, that, that would look at stars and planets sort of got their visions and understanding that way. So Daniel and his guys aren't, aren't in this meeting. They're still seen as foreigners. They're, they're new trainees. They've only been around for three years. They're kind of junior wise men. Daniel at this time, maybe 19, 20 years old. So the king tells his men, I had a dream. I'm bothered. I'm I'm anxious. And so the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell your servants a dream, and we'll give you the interpretation. O king, live forever. Which, which eventually many people believe turned into long live the king. It's a way you would address the king. Tell us a dream, we'll, we'll give you the interpretation. It'd be, it'd be like... Tell us the dream and we'll, we'll figure out what it means, the different symbols, the, the, the definition behind what you're seeing and what you're sensing. It'd be like if you or I had a dream. I mean, just imagine you dream something like this, that you're driving down the road and there's all these strange cans along the road <laughs> and everything's tore up. Nothing seems to make sense. <laughs> and then a barge hits a bridge and you're thinking, what? what you're dreaming this. And a pandemic occurs, and people are wearing a weird thing on their faces, standing six feet apart. And you're, you're dreaming all this stuff, and, and two really old guys are running for the leadership of the whole world. <laughs> and no one really wants them. And there's bears roaming through residential neighborhoods. And men are saying they're women. And people are hoarding toilet paper. And you wake up from this dream. And you say, tell me what this means. And people go, we have no idea. <laughs> We've had the same dream. If the king tells them the dream, they'll go to their books and their drugs and their stars and their superstitions, and they'll say, hey, well, the bridge means this, and the bears mean this, and pandemic means this, and sell a lot of vaccines and masks, and... Bears are a symbol, and on and on you could go. So, so they would take the dream and piece together these signs, these symbols, and answers. And how would anyone know if what they say is true? These wise men, these sorcerers, have, have great knowledge, supposedly. So King says, well, no, what you tell me the dream and the interpretation. There in verse 5, the king answers and says to the Chaldean, my, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut into pieces and your houses will be burned to the ground. They'll be made an ash heap. Wow. I don't know if you get a year-end job review at all for what you do <laughs> or, or grade your performance. But this is a tough guy to stand before. Now, now here's your job. I want you to, to do it. 
And if you don't, well, you're going to get hacked up, and we're going to burn your houses down. And this is not an idle threat. The Babylonians, the Assyrians of the ancient world were known for their brutality and their barbaric ways, their bloody massacres of their enemies. They were that way. Now, I'm sorry if you're here and you're a Babylonian or an Assyrian. No discrimination or harm is meant. When, when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judea for the third and final time, the king of Judah was Zedekiah. This is in Jeremiah 52. And Zedekiah is trying to escape, trying to get to Egypt. And Nebuchadnezzar captures him. And he commanded his sons. This is how brutal Nebuchadnezzar was. He had Zedekiah's sons killed right before his eyes. And then he had Zedekiah's eyes gouged out right after that. So the very final thing he ever saw was his own children being put to death. That, that's the cruelty of Nebuchadnezzar. So this is not an idle threat to the dream team. However, if you tell the dream, verse 6, and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and the interpretation. If you fail, it's death. If you succeed, riches and honor. It's kind of like Nebuchadnezzar's playing good cop, bad cop, same person. And, and, and the king is, is, is telling them to tell both sides of the story. The king answered again in verse 7, let the king tell his servants. That they answered to the king and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. King, be, be reasonable about this situation. And he responds, verse 8, I know for certain that you would gain time. You're stalling because you see that my decree is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me the interpretation. So, so they respond. He accuses them first of being liars and corrupt. Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. Nobody can do what you're asking us to do, king. And no one has ever asked anyone to do this. In other words, here's what they're saying. King, we're not the problem. You're the problem. You're asking us to do something that no one would ask anyone to do you're not being reasonable in this whole situation. They're putting the blame on him. It's a difficult thing that the king requests. And no one can do this. In fact, it says in verse 11, there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Only the gods could do this, they say. And they believed in, in, in many types of gods and, and would conjure up all kinds of visions and dreams from these gods. And God is setting, listen, God is setting the stage, so to speak, to show that the one true God of Daniel, the one and only God, can do what no other God can do and does give wisdom and understanding. First, he's disqualifying all the false gods. And God is using this dream, he's using this situation to, to show to this, this Babylonian world ruler that there is a one true God, and he has all wisdom. For this reason, the king was angry, verse 12, and very furious. 
and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they, be they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are all a part of the same team. And the king's very serious. They started killing. And, and then with the counsel and wisdom, Daniel is being sought out. He, he, he answers Arioch, the captain, verse 14, of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said, Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? And then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. Now, Daniel slows things down. He goes with wisdom and with tact and with counsel and poise. He speaks to the captain of the king's guard, Arioch, who's going to carry out the command. And Daniel's like, what, what's the big hurry? Why is this so urgent? He didn't question his authority. He didn't question the king's ability. He questions, why so quick to kill all of us? You haven't even heard us. You haven't even let us into the room yet. Why kill us? Uh, give us a shot, so to speak, it seems implied there. So, so Daniel's hear, hearing the story from this king's captain, and Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king's interpretation. And, and, and he gives him the answer, allows it. Daniel uses wisdom. He, he's counting on his past experience with the king, the character he's seen. It, it gives, gives him room to, to, to have an, a, a, an appearance before the king. Gives him time. And then Daniel went to his house, verse 17, and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azara, his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're using their Jewish names here, not the Babylonian ones. And Daniel is, is bringing the context back to the God of Israel to their God, their heritage, the only God who can supply the need that they have. And in verse 18, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Here's what's going on. And he's telling them what's happening, that they might seek the one true God. And, and it says there in, in verse 18, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven. God, God we need your mercy they're going to start with. Not because of who they are, not that they're any better than the other wise men, are pagan worshipers in Babylon. Even though their lifestyle is different, and even though they, they have proven themselves to be ten times wiser. But I would submit to you, and please listen, we all approach God, number one, based on His mercy. Based on His mercy. Not on our good works, not on our position, not on our lifestyle. God doesn't answer prayer because of our worth or our effort. Look how good I am, God. Look how hard I'm working. Or our character. But to the character of the one who's praying, we approach him with mercy. All, all prayer rests, if you will, upon the mercy of God. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. It's not a, it's not a magic thing we throw in at the end. But when you pray in Jesus' name, it means we come to God not on our own merit. We come to Him looking for mercy and grace that we have and can only receive from Jesus Christ, His Son. Amen? I mean, that's how we come. The one who's released us from sin by His death 
on the cross, to seek the mercies of God. That's where we're forgiven. Not the God of the Jewish temple, not the God of some land, but the one true God over all things in heaven. That's who they sought. Daniel was a man, listen, of prayer. I, I don't think they're like God, you know, please give us a dream. Give us the interpretation, God. Because here's what God's going to happen. We're going to die. I mean, that's how I would be praying. This crazy nutcase king is going to kill us. But in the very next chapter, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to be thrown into a burning furnace. And they will not bow down to an idol. It's not that they're praying in fear. So I don't think the motivation is totally focused on staying alive. I think the motivation, the main concern, as being that being killed with all the other wise men would mean their God was just as powerless as these false gods of Babylon. Their focus is on who God is and how God will be seen through their life. And so they begin to pray for mercy. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. So they go to prayer. And verse 19, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. How amazing is that? Almost an instantly God gives the, the dream. And I believe the interpretation of the dream with great spiritual significance and clarity, they go before the God, they ask for mercy, and God gives a vision to Daniel. And he runs out of the room like Usain Bolt, straight to Nebuchadnezzar, and let him know he didn't do that. That's not what he does. Look what happens in verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Now think about this. You're under an urgent death sentence. Your life is on the line. You go to God in prayer, and there's an immediate, obvious answer to prayer. Let, let me ask you this. Have you ever had an immediate, obvious answer to prayer? It's one of the most exciting things on the face of the earth. You've got a situation, you've got a, you got a condition or something's going on in your life, and you begin to pray, and all of a sudden, God answers. Woo! It's amazing. Talk about getting excited. You can imagine Daniel's like, oh my gosh, God gave me a vision. A quick story. I get saved at 19 years of age. Never really went to church God starts doing amazing things in my life. I get off drugs. That was a miracle. I always said, I'll smoke pot the rest of my life. <laughs> Got off of that, some other drugs. I stopped smoking cigarettes. I, I went back to high school. I was a high school dropout at 16. I finished high school, and I didn't do the GED thing. I went back to a real school, older. Not smoking, not using drugs, going to church every time the door was open and praying, sharing Jesus with my friends. They had a new believers class at the church I was going to. I, I couldn't get enough of it. I was praying all the time. Several of my friends got saved, and we, we started attending this, this new believers class. And, and one time a representative came by from Southeastern Bible College in Lakeland, and he passed out packets to those who might be interested in getting into ministry. Now, I had just finished high school, 19 years old. I'm looking through the packet. There's, there's requirements, there's classes, there's majors, it's an accredited college, and, and there's Bible, there's missions, there's ministerial positions, and I thought, and then I saw the cost of tuition. I took the packet. At that time in my life, I had a little Volkswagen bug. I could barely keep gas in the Volkswagen bug. And I prayed. I said, Lord, 
th this is probably a silly prayer, but if you want me to go to Bible college, you have to answer this prayer. Now, now looking back, I finished high school. I, I'm not smoking. I'm not all out all night anymore. My mom used to sometimes send my younger brother, go see if you can find your brother. He's out there somewhere. I had gotten a job, and I cut my hair. I, they didn't name me Shadrach or anything, but I was, I was different. And I think my mom, who had remarried now, my stepdad, was probably thinking, ah, what in the world's going on? And I'm praying, okay, God, you know, I'd love to do this, but do you want me to go to Bible college? Do you want me to stay? What do you want me to do? And one night, we're all sitting around the house. My mom lived over on Florida Avenue. We moved to Gulf Breeze when I was 16. My mom had five children. My stepdad had three. We're all together in the, this little living room. And I think my stepdad had been drinking. He wasn't a Christian at that time. He graduated from Florida State. And he kind of made this statement. He said, you know, Pat, that was my mom's name, Patricia. If one of these kids would go to college, none of them have gone. I'd pay for it. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Is this real? So at first I went to my mom. Is he serious? She goes, well, that's what he said. She said, so why? I said, well, I got this packet. She said, what kind of packet? I showed it to her. She goes, well, go talk to him. No, no I don't want to talk to him. Go talk to him. He, he was kind of a rough guy. He looked like Jed Clampett on the Beverly Hillbillies, if you've ever seen it. Seriously, he looked a lot like him. He was a German guy, too. His last name was Schluter. I was a little intimidated. So I walk in with the packet. Hey, remember you made that statement? Yeah. And I was the most unlikely one of the whole crew. He's looking at it, flipping the pages. He looks up at me, he goes, I don't know if I meant no Bible college. <laughs> and I think my mom was standing in the hallway listening. She walked into the room and said, Ernie, you said college. He's the only one who wants to go. And God immediately answered my prayer. Talk about exciting. I thought, oh my gosh, this is real. And I'm sure Daniel must have felt the same way. All of a sudden, he gets the dream. He gets the interpretation. I mean, he, he must be, like, so excited. But instead of running straight to the king, what does he do? He begins to praise the Lord. He begins to worship. He, he begins to, to pray and, and, and thank God. I mean, they're about to get hacked up. They're, they're about to get killed. But God, listen, God answers prayer. James chapter 5 verse 16. Confess your trespass to one another and pray for one another. You may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Not righteous that you're so good, but you've been made righteous by Jesus Christ. And those prayers avail much. He listens. So they praise the Lord. They, they, they ask for for wisdom. Verse 21. Verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the season. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. The God of heaven is the God of all seasons, of all events, of all time. Probably just what was on King Nebuchadnezzar's mind in his dream, God is in charge of it all. In James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God, what do we do in this situation? How do we approach this difficult time in life? Where, where do we go? 
We're, we're about to be hacked up and our houses burned. Daniel began to pray. God's given him the answer, and now he's responding. In verse 22, he reveals deep secret things. He knows what's in the darkness, and light dwells in him. What is dark and hidden to all the wise men and the soothsayers and the magicians and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, what is hidden to Nebuchadnezzar is open and known, and nothing, listen, nothing is hidden from God. He knows what's in the darkness. All things you may hide or think that are secret, he knows. So, so Daniel and his friends, I, I thank you and praise you, O God, my fathers, verse 23. You have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's Demand. God wants to display his love and his wisdom and his mercy through his people. And that's what he's doing for Daniel. In fact, in Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. Call upon me. Call upon me and I will deliver you and you shall what? Glorify me. It's exactly what they're doing. God's delivered them. They've called on him. They glorify him. See, God reaches out. He knows how to get our attention. He knows how to get our attention. He, he sees what we think no one else sees. He answers prayer. What might seem impossible can really be the beginning of something amazing. There's no way I thought that I would go from, from getting saved to, to, to going to Bible college and be there for four years and meet my wife, and God would lead me down this path step by step, revealing and giving amazing direction and guidance. What might seem impossible can be the beginning of something amazing. What is a mystery to me is history to him. He knows everything from beginning to end. The hidden sin, which our conscience is ashamed of and afraid that someone might know about, are all known to him. But, 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 but also joined to that, he also knows all the circumstances and our weaknesses which lead us to do what we do. He knows both sides. And he's always leading those who will follow. He's always leading those who will follow out of their darkness into his marvelous light. In 1 Peter 2.9, I think Neil shared this verse last week, that, that in this culture this, that we live in, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you where? Out of darkness into this marvelous light. So listen, here's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the dark. God, we're in the dark. We don't know this dream. We, we can't interpret it. And God brought them in to his marvelous light. God, God, I don't know what I'm going to do with this situation in my life. Uh, this is going on, or I'm addicted to this, or I'm trapped with this. I hope no one finds out about that. And God says, hey, I want to deliver you into my marvelous light. Recognize that I'm merciful. Recognize that I see your situation. Maybe you're here right now, and God has been speaking to you about something in your life. Maybe you've never come to Christ, or, or you need to be forgiven, or, or you need to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. He, he's a God of mercy. He's a God of love. Daniel finds himself in this foreign land. He finds himself in a different culture. He finds himself uh, facing a sword, and, and, and they've already started killing some of the wise men. They're part of that same dream team, and he thinks, well, we're next. But hey, wait a minute. Slow down. We haven't had a chance yet. 
And he uses wisdom that God gave him to approach this captain of the king. Now he has an audience. He probably didn't expect that. Wow, I'm actually here. I'm talking to the king. King, give me some time. Yes, I, I don't think your request is unreasonable. Let's see if the God of all gods can answer. And he seeks his mercy. He seeks his answers. He seeks his light. And I think because of the character and because of the performance of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ten times better when they graduated from dream team school, the king goes, okay, let's give them a shot. And God, who has orchestrated this whole thing, taking the sleep from the most powerful man in the world, I mean, he didn't have propanol like Michael Jackson. He couldn't just give himself a shot. God was doing this. He was anxious. He was upset. And God has a way of dealing with our conscience, dealing with our hearts, bringing us to a place where he wants to reveal his mercy and his power and his love. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of love. And in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus would say it this way to those who have a troubled heart, to those who feel under the weight of their conscience or sin or they're walking in darkness and they think no one else knows, Jesus has a way of speaking to you. Maybe through a dream. Maybe through a friend. Maybe through that still, small voice that says, hey, behold, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If you'll open it up. I'll come in. God does this amazing, unexpected revelation to Daniel, who doesn't freak out, but waits upon the Lord and asks him for wisdom. What's, what's going on in your world right now, in your culture, in your life? Well, what's going on in your heart that God needs to respond to? Maybe you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. I know what that's like. I was there once. Sitting in the church my first time thinking, what is this all about? And if you've never received him or if you need to make a fresh commitment to him, this would be a great day to come back into his fold, back into the light, back into his mercy, back into his grace. The Bible would say it like this over and over. Today is a day of salvation. The enemy will always say this to you. You can do this later. You've got tomorrow. But the Lord always says, today. And my wife and I jumped in our car, my car, early Wednesday morning, and we drove all the way to Bristol, Tennessee, if you know where that is. It's right on the Virginia-Tennessee border. The, the lady who was the maid of honor in our wedding, and my wife was the maid of honor in her wedding, her husband passed. And they live there in, well, they live in Blountsville, Blountsville, Tennessee. Got to drive through Knoxville to get to Blountsville. So we drove up. And we went to the funeral, and we jumped in the car the next day and drove straight home. But here's the thing. He didn't have tomorrow, her husband. Levin was his name, Levin Toll. Wonderful guy. In fact, at the end of the service, they said, we want to share Levin's most favorite verse. A little Levin, Levin's a whole lot. Everybody laughed. He wanted it to be a time of celebration, and it was. But it would not have been a time of celebration had he not known the Lord Jesus Christ. Had he not come out of the darkness and into the light. And you know what? No one knows what tomorrow holds. Today, the scripture says, is the day of salvation. The enemy always says, oh, you have tomorrow. Maybe. Right? Who knows? God does this amazing thing, this miraculous answer to prayer, 
And then Daniel and his men take some time to worship and praise and give honor to the one true God. What an amazing story. And this is just half of the story in chapter 2. The rest we'll share next week.